Good morning from Bangladesh. I, Tahsina Yasmin, welcome you all to the business talk with Teachpreneurs of Bangladesh and Stanford University, USA. Today's talk will cover the specific area of digital entrepreneurship for sustainable business. And we are honored to have with us Professor George Foster, Professor Stanford Graduate School of Business, Stanford University, USA, as our keynote speaker and chief guest. We are delighted to have Professor Mustafa Azad Kamal, Professor, School of Business and Treasurer, Bangladesh Open University, and Professor Mohammad Masum Iqbal, Dean, Faculty of Business and Entrepreneurship, Daffodil International University, Bangladesh, as our panelists and special guests. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Mohammad Akhtar Zaman, Director, Blended Learning Center, DIU, as the session reactor. Now, before we start with the most important part of the talk, which is the keynote address by Professor Foster, I would like to introduce him very briefly with all of you. George Foster holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in economics from the University of Sydney and a doctorate from the Graduate School of Business, Stanford University. He taught at the University of Chicago and the Australian Graduate School of Management prior to joining the GSB faculty at Stanford University. George Foster's research and teaching includes entrepreneurship, early stage companies, financial analysis, etc. Professor Foster has won multiple research awards, including the AICPA Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Accounting Literature. He received the title, the Order of Australia, declared in June 2019 for his significant service to education. And now I would like to welcome Professor George Foster for his keynote speech. Over to you, Professor Foster. Well, thanks very much and welcome. It's good to be with a British Commonwealth country. And um, I'm my favorite sport is cricket too. So I'm sort of very familiar with um, Bangladesh. Um, just as a introduction, um, my two areas that I focus a lot on are entrepreneurship and sports management. And the um, one of the areas I focus on is building new ventures. And uh, the, I've done a fair amount of research in this area. I was um, chairman of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Entrepreneurship, where we studied a whole lot of ways at which early stage companies are built up in different parts of the world. Um, and um, I've got two reports from the World Economic Reform that I led or co-led that I'm happy to send to um, a car that you can distribute. They're free of charge. Uh, World Economic Forum doesn't charge this, but they're about 500 pages each. So you may want to not read it overnight. Uh, but anyway, I think uh, what I'll do is talk through some general uh, areas of putting the pieces together of building a digital venture and then give an example of a company that really relies on digital to uh, do its, its goods and services but really fascinating because it's it's pre predominant early market was in education uh, and which all professors around the world have been using zoom predominantly as the major forum of doing this um, so um, basically, the slide here is when I always look at new ventures or proposals for new ventures, I'm looking at a variety of areas to see where are the pieces in the place already, where are the pieces that have to be put in place. Because by definition, an early stage venture is just in its genesis. Now, sometimes it can be developed over time and it could be sizably put in place. Other times it's the German of idea. And you have to understand what the difference is those two, because if it's a German of idea, you're really betting on the management team and a lot more than if it's, in fact, a, a um, something that's developed over time. Then what you're doing, actually, is you're trying to assess have the pro have they made progress or not. And the, the main areas that most people will look at the two or three areas are what's the market opportunity? And that's a major distinction between are you creating value for consumers and are you capturing value for consumers? So in order to capture value for consumers, you've got to have a business model, which enables you to sort of monetize what the value is. And that's an area where a lot of ventures created a lot of opportunities for consumers, 
but they didn't have the appropriate revenue. And I think this is one of the challenges in the educational sector is that there is a lot of people coming on and providing free content, but free content doesn't allow you to sort of build scale because there's no revenues coming in unless you've got something like an advertising model, which education has never really uh, cottoned on to. Maybe a subscription model may be doing. The three areas that you typically get will be transactions, subscription, and advertising. And you have to work out in the business model which set of those threes that you're trying to do. Um, leadership, you're, you're assessing that. There is a major dispute in, in venture capital in different parts of the world. Is it the leaders, is it the team, or is it the idea? Um, I think a lot of people, if it's a very early stage company, are really fundamentally looking at the team. Because much as you'd like to think that you've got a very good idea of what the market opportunity is, the chances are when you get to scale, that opportunity will be morphed differently than you think. And then there's a variety of other people, the, part, the financing, the marketing, the scaling. And so next slide. And so this is a, a diagram that I always put in. There's various different versions of this. Uh, I'm not claiming this is unique at all. Uh, basically, this is just filling out those areas. And the, and the and next slide, the, the, the key thing about this is that over time, you expect to see progress going on in this area. And so I always say you come back to a venture and see, okay, after say a year or after a major, say a major customer adoption, how much progress have you made in building the management team? How much progress have you made in developing the business model exception? So the idea is to have a rigorous structure on this. Um, and so I'll just give an example here. And so if we move on to the next slide, Akva. Uh, this is the example of Zoom, and it, it really does show uh, a company that actually had its heritage in the 90, uh, in the um, 2000 and two, uh, 2006 era or earlier. Actually, it's, it's mid nine mid 90s, uh, 96, 98. Uh, a company came along called Webex. And WebEx was a venture. It was uh, the two founders. One was Chinese, one was Indian. They were both in Silicon Valley. And they developed a product that was an online uh, interactive base where you could have conferences online. It was specifically targeted for the business end market. And one of the early employees of that was a individual called Eric Yuan, Y-U-A-N, who was a major technical person. He was born in China, but came to the U.S., uh, when he was about in the early 20s. And Eric uh, was at that with, with um, WebEx, and WebEx got acquired by a larger company, Cisco. And Cisco is a company actually that came out of Stanford University when a husband and wife were trying to work out how they could communicate with each other, say so they build what we call a network, and that was the, the heritage of Cisco. But the challenge was when they built, uh, when they acquired WebEx, they didn't really put a lot of effort into developing that on an ongoing basis. And Eric Rian got very uh, disillusioned by the progress that had been made in terms of addressing the issues that he wanted. And so in two, and uh, do the next slide, Hector. Uh, this is, um, I actually use this as a case in class, and this is a student example of, um, what are the steps in terms of utilizing this? And I, I'm not going to read the um, stuff at the bottom, but uh, what 213, what this was the early days of um, a Zoom. And they tried to get funding and nobody would fund them because they said, if you are building a company and it's just a online conferencing company, that is a digital online conference company, there are already major competitors out there like WebEx now is Cisco and, and Microsoft was in the game. And so Eric found himself, a lot of people saying, why are you doing this? You're, you're beating your head against the wall. But what he decided to do is he said, whereas the existing products had been built up over time and they were built for enterprise markets, they were very complex to operate. What he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to design a product that is the ultimate in simplicity. 
I'm going to build it from the grassroots. And there were about 20 or 30 people with Cisco who was so attached to Eric and his vision that they left Cisco and joined him. So they were on very good salaries at Cisco. And, and they went to this startup that everybody was saying, this is not going to work. But the key thing that he was doing is he's saying, I want to go and make customers. And, and they have a philosophy at, at Zoom of making customers happy. It sounds a true, it sounds trivial, but it's not trivial if you believe that that means you've got to take account of customer feedback all the time. What was their first market test of, of success? Well, what they did is they went into the education market. And the education market, they, their, their first place that they tried was at Stanford University. And so they, they had several online courses that uh, we were operating with much more complex online facilities. But the trouble is um, they, they were sort of just many to one. There wasn't much interaction in terms of from an education angle. And over time, what WebEx has tried to do is create as much as possible an interaction between as if you're in a room with a professor and there's back and forth and a capability of having like breakout rooms that sometimes we use in teaching. And so his argument was going into education was a very demanding market because the students would give feedback very quickly. If this wasn't simple, they would, if they had trouble getting on, the professors would hear about that very, very quickly. Uh, and, and so that was a successful first step. He then went into one of two other universities who had the same reaction that the students said, this is a much more compelling product. And so the contract that was written was a contract with the university at a very low rate, which was one tenth of what Stanford had been paying WebEx to operate some of these online educations. So he said, what we're offering is simplicity. We have a business model. It's only going to work if we get a lot of scale. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to use that as a proof of concept uh, and expand into other markets. And then he started to say, okay, we don't want to go into the enterprise market at the high end because that's too demanding. And actually that was one of their Achilles heels in initial sense is their security wasn't as good as what it was with Cisco. And that came back to haunt them later. But they went into the small and medium business market and they started to make success in that, which was about 217, 218. Uh, next slide. Now, one of the things, and again, I'll, I'll leave these slides with you so that you can use this as an example. One of the things that I like to do is talk about how does a team build up its management uh, how does a company build up its management team? Well, what happens in Silicon Valley is that people go to one company and they start to navigate or to sort of follow one or two people. And what this means is that Zoom, when it started, several employees had been with, well, I said, 30, 20 to 30 engineers had been with Eric at Cisco. They came across. But interestingly, some very senior people had also been with Eric at WebEx before they got acquired by Cisco. So he had a group of loyal employees. And part of the secret is these employees were part of the vetting machine in terms of who joined the company. So normally what happens, one of the challenges is when you hire people in an early stage company, a lot of those people don't work out. Now, that's because you, you don't have that much background on them. And they tell a good story when you're doing interviews, but over time, it just was, there's not a good fit or they overpromised or what they, their ability was, or it could have been, you didn't know how to use them properly. But what had happened here is that these are all people who knew each other for quite a while. And they decided as Zoom made a lot of progress, they weren't going to allow other people to come in who would destroy the culture. And, and in a fast growing company, the more you can sort of keep the management team relatively well aligned, that's a central thing in growing a company. It's also central if you say hire a new marketing person who's going to be head of marketing, that person has to have a very good sense of 
what it's like to work in an early stage company. Now, in the US, if you start hiring people from very large enterprise companies because you think they could sell in the enterprise market, that's a trap that a lot of these companies, early stage companies fall into because they're used to having a personal assistant. They're used to going business class on airplanes, those type of things. And an early stage company can't handle that. And so there was a real culture created there of this is a fast growing, highly structured culture. And we're going to keep on growing fast if we retain as much as that culture. So the employees were very much the gatekeeper who got into the tent as well as the CEO. Um, next slide. And this, this is just an example of a buildup. Most of the cases, I've, I've done 100 cases. And, and probably 30 or 40 of them are on early stage companies. It's very unusual to be able to trace where the employees came from and, and what was a relationship before. Because I had written cases on WebEx and I knew Cisco very well, I was able to sort of build up this as an example because Zoom is such a ma massive success story now. We could go back and say, okay, well, these are all people who joined in these years. They're still there. And that's a very remarkable thing in terms of Silicon Valley. And the one or two exits have exited very much for personal reason and have not gone to other companies. They've taken some of the money they made from Zoom and started investing in their own ventures, or they've decided that they wanted to, to sort of spend a bit more time with the children on that. Next slide. Uh, next one, too. That's just OK. So they one of the other things you want to do is build a board of directors. And uh, this also gets to the financing of the company. As I said, when they started in 211, they really didn't get much money till about 213, 214. The first major investor actually was the former CEO of WebEx. So the former CEO of WebEx knew, knew Eric from his WebEx days. And he, and he also went to Cisco and had a, not a very good experience in Cisco. And he said, I'm, I will back Eric no matter what. And so he wrote him a check for 250000 And so, you know, that's obviously worth a lot now. But, I mean, that's the sort of thing you need because the venture capitalists were saying not really interested. The very first major named investor was about five years later, was a company, Sequoia, which is one of the two, three or big, three biggest venture capitalist firms in, in Silicon Valley. And once they got on board, there was a lot more credibility added to the organization. So it, it, in the early days, it was growing reasonably well. Next slide. Okay, next slide too. No, I'll just go through this. This is the funding of the company. And what you can see is that February 2015, they did raise um, a round of 30 million. So the amounts raised was 250,000, and then uh, in 2013, 9 million, then they raised another 6.5. But the first, what are called sizable amounts for Silicon Valley was a 30 million. But 30 million is not a lot of money if it's four years after on that. But this is where you can see uh, Sequoia comes in and it puts in 114 million. Actually, they put in 100 million because there were some other people following, following on. So that's the financing of this company. Um, it's now, uh, I didn't look it up um, today, but it's probably worth 40 billion uh, or something like in, in that order there. Next slide. Okay. So the other thing before we um, open it up for discussion on this, uh, and I'll, I'll just make some comments on education sector innovations too. Um, what happened is when the pandemic hit in February, uh, February, March of 2000, Zoom was going along at a level of about 10 million, five to 10 million users at most. Really, it was actually about four. And then what happened as the education market initially switched over, and, and this was a, a more consumer sector, switched over to start using Zoom, they, they had huge increases in adoption. But the trouble was the systems weren't developed for that. And this is one of the things that you have to do in building 
a high scaling company, can you track, can you scale quickly? Well, most early stage companies have a ability to rig, I mean, sequence their scaling because it's more driven by the internal development of the company. This was a pandemic where it was developed by this huge influx in demand from outside the, the, the company itself. And they either could make the decision, do we not fulfill that huge influx in demand or do we sort of try and manage it? Well, they, no, logically, you would expect a Silicon Valley company will try to manage it. Well, I'll just show you some of the problems they ran into. Next slide. Oh, this, yeah, next slide. This is just ways at which it expanded. Next. So what happened is in March, April, as the pandemic absolutely hit them, what we had is a variety of situations that forced Zoom into crisis management. So I'll just highlight a couple of them, and then I'll make some general comments. So one of them is Zoom bombing. So next slide. Zoom bombing is, and this occurred in a lot of the educational sector, is that a lot of the students would log in and they wouldn't, they didn't protect themselves in terms of the universities using it, didn't require them to use as much security getting in as they, they should have. And other people got hold of the security and they started coming into the classes and making comments that some of them were racial. Uh, we have people coming in and exposing themselves sexually to the students. And so you could just imagine uh, the challenge that this faced in terms of if you are trying to run a class and you've got these third party actors coming in who are trying to disrupt and, and destroy the educational atmosphere, that's the sort of thing that media likes to hammer a company on. So instantaneously, these Zoom bombing examples became on national television, broadcast cable television all around the world. And the trouble for Zoom is that Zoom now became very much not online teaching, but you're Zooming. So Zoom started to change from being a noun to a verb. I mean, just as uh, like, Professor Foster, if I yeah. may interrupt, uh, there were uh, cases of pedophiles getting into the Zoom classes of young children. And yes. uh, there were cases of abusers too. Yes. So, so imagine uh, some universities said we're not going to use Zoom anymore. And and so that and and so Zoom had to do a lot of education in terms of ways at which to protect themselves. A second example, and this is really the security. Next slide. The, the, the security breaches uh, and, and, and the Zoom bombing was security breaches. But what happened here is that that highlighted to a whole lot of corporates that this wasn't a secure platform. And so then they had to sort of really come in and, and, and beef up the security. Now, I'm not going to go through more of the uh, security. So what I'll do now is I'll just make some general comments about how Zoom has tried to refine their products. So one of the things that we like to do in classes is that it's, I, I'm teaching students at the moment and Stanford's not allowed to have students. Um, we've just started actually. Uh, for the first three quarters that I've been teaching, it's been all online teaching, which we've never done before. Well, the trouble is the students just sit there and they, it's hard to get them engaged sometimes. So what Zoom has done is have us been able to do breakout rooms. And, and so I can lecture for 10 minutes. And then if I've got a guest coming into the classroom, the guest may make some comments. And in order to have a whole series of questions structured in a, a sort of fairly useful way, I break up the students and send them into the Zoom chat rooms. And I can direct who goes into the chat rooms. I can make it random. And then I can sort of, they can come back and I can have them asked in sequence questions. So one of the things you're trying to avoid is somebody talking into a screen and the students sitting there in a passive way. So online education now has become much more a fight to keep engagement from the students. When we're in the classroom, you can track the engagement. And if somebody's distracted, you can actually pull them in. 
And in the classroom, I can go up to a student and I've, I typically have classes of say 60 to 80 students where they've got their name tags on. If I see a student sort of not paying attention, I'll actually zap into that student, sometimes walk up to them and say, what do you think? And if the student hasn't been thinking, the idea is to make them say, don't do that again. I know it's it's sort of, I mean, it's, it's creating an atmosphere in the classroom where you want people to be engaged. It's hard to do that online. And so that's why we have these extra facilitation devices. Another thing that we can do is that we can have that we, Zoom has got all these hands in, hands up signs. So if I'm asking a question, I can have students put up their hand electronically. And that, that enables me to sort of not go and ask people who aren't prepared or ask people who aren't willing to sort of talk on that. So again, the idea is to bring in these devices. Um, what Zoom's worried about is what is this, the growth of Zoom post-pandemic. Um, what one of the things they're trying to do is, well, what happens if we could have translation devices so that if I'm teaching in English, I, I, it can be interpreted, it, it can be translated instantaneously to go into, uh, say, languages of um, any any country. Now, you know, not we can't do all the dialects, but I mean, I, there, there could be a Bangladesh uh language in terms of one or two of the languages there that there's a ai device that's instantaneously doing that so i mean the idea is to sort of create a a more global effective teaching platform that that crosses countries and crosses languages and again that's the sort of thing that we haven't been able to do effectively in the classroom uh but electronic education enables you with some innovations to do that. So uh, I've got us at, uh, uh, I've up spoken for 28 minutes. So uh, the agreement was I would talk for about the first 30 minutes and then we'd have a uh, discussion and Q &A. But Professor Foster, we need you to finish your presentation. We are really enjoying the talk. So even if you uh, take an extra minute or two or five minutes, it's okay with us. Okay, um, all right. So. Next slide. So um, one of the challenges that Eric Yan had is that um, some of he because he was born in China, he had a lot of heritage there. And because he when he was at WebEx, a lot of the development was done in China. He went and did some of the development in China. Now, the relationships between the US and China are not exactly smooth at the moment. And so that was used by some people to criticize. And in fact, some, and I think the next, you can do the next slide. The, the, the next thing was that allegations that Zoom is a Chinese company. That was not meant as a positive. That meant was a criticism. And in fact, the Speaker of the House uh, talked, the Speaker of the House in the US is called Nancy Pelosi. And she, she called Zoom a Chinese entity. It's not. And there was criticisms that Eric Yan was a Chinese operative in the US. He wasn't, he's a US citizen. And to become a US citizen, you have to give up, China will not allow you to be a joint citizen. So, I mean, that was something of which they had to handle. Uh, there's only about three slides to go uh, on this. Next one, um, because politicians like to sort of create names for themselves and uh, show that they're standing up uh, for voting purposes, uh, the New York Attorney General started to say we're scrutinizing the security practices of Zoom. Remember, this is a company that's only going being grown around seven years, but it's being attacked. And and I mean, they weren't really ready for the growth of the company, but they weren't really prepared for the political attacks. But that's what happens with any venture that grows at this stage and enters in a domain at which you expose yourself to a lot of criticism. Next one, these are the next ones are government prohibitions about people could not use Zoom, uh, government entities. Again, this is all publicity for the company. Now, luckily, what was happening is that Zoom had increased its security, but also the usage of Zoom, because it was so simple, 
the education market and all the other markets said, we can handle these issues because we would rather have a, a system like Zoom and, and work around the problems than, than do complex programs that are not set for intuitive and not sim for simplicity. And so I think we're just about at the last couple of slides. Next one. Yeah, so these are the companies that were blacklisting Zoom. And you can see the United States Senate said we wouldn't use it for a while, the German Foreign Ministry, uh, the Australian Defence Forces, all these were criticising Zoom for securities, and rightly so in some of the security matters. So what that meant is that Zoom had to quickly, massively put resources onto security uh, of the system, which they did. Uh, last one, I think we'll make this the last one. Okay, so what were the steps they did to manage the crisis? Well, Eric Zoom has got a policy of you be totally transparent. This is not a normal CEO's policy. Normally, if there's a problem, you try and bury the problem. What he said is that he would go on and every week he would update you on what the progress they make in addressing those challenges. So he put his name on the block and said, I have to come back to you every week and describe what progress I've made in the last week to address these issues. Uh, he had the management team. I mean, I've, uh, I've interacted with the management team a lot. Obviously, in the six months from March 2020 to September, they weren't having much sleep. But they were so committed to the organization that they were addressing the issues relatively well. They've had enormous growth in the management team. Uh, and again, that's been blessed because a lot of the existing management were very careful in who they led in the tent. And so I would say that the message here is that any startup venture is going to have what I call a roller coaster journey. This is a roller coaster journey like no, no other. You don't go from zero in 211 to be 65 billion at this stage on the back of early education market on that going to the broader economy and then facing a pandemic without things not all working out. And the main thing is to say, uh, prioritize so that you stay laser beam focus on product simplicity, customer adoption and customer happiness. And that I think is the driving force, I think in any education venture, because basically if the students don't find the content gripping and if the students find the platform at which you're teaching on clunky or just incredibly difficult to operate, the education experience is going to be minimal. And I think that's what we're all trying to do is create a great educational experience for our students. And the last thing we need to do is have the technology get in the middle, not be the technology being the operative way at which we enhance engagement and learning. That's, that's the end of the talk. Thank you so much, Professor Foster. Uh, we uh, we have heard about the you know expansion of Zoom uh, for the you know which happened recently during the pandemic. But your case uh, is so detailed, and it's always interesting to learn about this uh, ventures which started really small, like you talked about Webex and Cisco, and how it moved on to Zoom and uh, all these unpredictable challenges overcoming the uh, company and how the company in real life they faced those challenges so it was um i found it very interesting though i don't actually belong to the business community and i hope the students who are with us who are business students and the faculty members they found the talk really interesting and invigorating so now we'll move on uh, with the discussion by the panelists we have two panelists with us as i have mentioned before um, the first one that I uh, would like to give floor is Professor Mustafa Azad Kamal. And I uh, want Professor Kamal to focus on maybe uh, Bangladeshi cases or, you know, local context regarding entrepreneurship that um, you know and uh, you might want to share with our audience. So over to you, Professor Kamal. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Professor Foster, uh, for this nice presentation. Uh, I was actually uh enjoying a lot and uh, learned a lot of uh, terms and uh, ideas and experiences from this presentation 
so in bangladesh actually uh, we know that the government got uh, a variety of initiatives to promote uh, entrepreneurship at uh, uh, the the young uh, uh, entrepreneurs level because uh, here you know uh, if you consider uh, under 35 age you will find a huge population is under 35 so if we can promote uh, entrepreneurship among them so it will be uh, a huge impact or it will create a huge impact and government got some policy you know the ICT policy uh, it was uh, back in 19, uh, 2009 government uh, undertook this policy and uh, we are expecting that uh, we will reach uh, the digital bangladesh status by uh, 2021 so for that uh, a lot of initiative uh, recently taken for uh, creating digital uh, entrepreneurship uh, one project uh, has been initiated by uh, the ict ministry it is uh, called idea project so they are trying to uh, support the uh, entrepreneurship at a young level i mean uh, uh, they are pro trying to promote the startups so they are planning uh, almost uh, 1000 plus uh, startups uh, and, uh, and another initiative is bangladesh uh, university young entrepreneurship sponsorship activities so recently that has been inaugurated by the ict minister and uh, uh, the, the plan is to encourage the young entrepreneurs so recently during the COVID, we saw that uh, a lot of young entrepreneurs, they came forward and they actually, they have whatever skill they have. Basically, uh, social media based kind of entrepreneurship like online selling, it is hugely uh, actually uh, established all over the country, uh, especially the young entrepreneurs, they are engaged here. And a lot of other uh, initiatives are taken by these uh, young entrepreneurs in, in Bangladesh for last uh, one decade. So all these things together, if we think that uh, if uh, this one uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, drives uh, are to be uh, uh, moved forward, we uh, need a uh, kind of need to focus on our education because since the, the title of this uh, webinar uh, start with teacher teach uh, preneur so teach preneur uh, so what we the teachers are doing to create the uh, entrepreneurship to promote entrepreneurship among the uh, students so that is very much vital so this is still a uh, kind of missing some universities are doing but all over the uh, in all over uh, bangladesh if uh, all the educational institutions they can come forward i think it will be uh, more effective so whatever entrepreneurship is going on it is uh, not that much significant but it can be uh, promoted a lot because the young entrepreneurs they are very much interested and government is providing some support, financial support, some uh, skills trainings are there. A2Y is providing these supports also. They are providing some training and some uh, university institutes are doing that. But an educational institution as a whole, they uh, must come forward to uh, provide this kind of uh, training so that the, the students can be encouraged to be uh, the entrepreneurs. So, the education in bangladesh traditionally is it is kind of knowledge and skill based in some cases little skill is there and mostly knowledge based but for entrepreneurship it uh, empowerment empowerment is needed because the knowledge and skills are the achievements so i always believe that the mindset and the confidence on uh, myself is very important so the so students they are getting knowledge and skills but they cannot accomplish because the, their mindset is not uh, ready and also they cannot depend on themselves. So as a whole, uh, I think uh, there should be a kind of uh, transformation because uh, reform is not enough to promote entrepreneurship at a broader scale. So I think uh, uh, the educational institutions like the uh, other educational institutions can come forward and uh, they should promote uh, this entrepreneurship uh, skills among all the students so that uh, the young people they don't need to be uh, unemployed so in Bangladesh, yes professor kamal if i may interrupt like um the uh, 
chairman of the trustee board, uh, Dr. Mohamed Sobur Khan, always encourages our students uh, by saying that you should not be job seekers, rather you should be job givers. And uh, I think in Bangladesh, we are the only university who um, has a you know, entrepreneurship department. And uh, we always, you know, encourage students because we have projects like, are you the next startup? Uh, we have business incubator where we support the students uh, by, you know, financing their uh, ideas, small ventures. So um, I think you are right when you are saying that it's in the mindset because students generally, and especially the families of the students, they expect students to graduate from university and then look for a job, a settled job, not getting themselves into a risky venture. So I think you were very much right that the educational institutions or us, the teachpreneurs, we can encourage them. We can encourage them for taking up ventures, exploring their ideas. Um, so that was a very pertinent idea. Yes. Please go on, sir. Now, okay, so what I, I, I wanted to say that uh, we need to actually uh, go for transformation because the curriculum, what we are using, these are not uh, entrepreneurship fr friendly at all. So we have to think on that. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we talk about skill. So skill can be trained, fine. But if you like to accomplish that knowledge and skill, you need to be engaged. But uh, the, at the university education or any level of education, you will not find that much engagement with the community, with the business uh, sector or industry sector. The students are not going there. They are not working there. So uh, in, in other countries, we see that the, the students are engaged in the, the workplace, at the workplaces. So they get some uh, mindset from there. They get some skills from there and the knowledge from there. So that is very, very important. So when we teach in the class, so we uh, whatever we are doing, whatever uh, theory we are teaching for entrepreneurship, on entrepreneurship or something like that, it uh, doesn't work because the students are not being engaged in any uh, activity. For example, we are giving a case, uh, for example, a lot of case studies are, are uh, to be done by the students uh, since I'm in, in the business faculty. But what happens? These are the written cases, but they don't actually get the feeling of working with a real life problem. So that is very, very important. So if in the curriculum, we can uh, put a high weight uh, on the real life engagements of the students at community level or whatever level, then uh, the students can be empowered. So that's why I don't uh, like to use the term education because education gives us uh, the knowledge and a little skill. So these are the achievements. We need to go for uh, accomplishment. And for accomplishment, we need what I said, the mindset and the self-dependence. So, so we have to understand our ability, what ability we have. So the students doesn't have uh, that mindset. They, they think that, yeah, we learned this theory, we uh, got this certificate. So their emphasis on that, they never identify their ability. So that is the, the big gap. And uh, I, I'll, I'll finish by one quote. Uh, it was by, from uh, Donald Clare in 2012. In a, in a trade talk, he said that uh, in last 10 years, whatever pedagogical uh, changes happened in the world, especially in, in, uh, in terms of technology, it was more than uh, the changes occurred in uh, last thousand years. So we, the teachers at the university and other institutions, have we been changed in that direction? So a lot of changes are going on, but we are staying in the same uh, pedagogical uh, uh, process. So we need to transform. That's why reform is not enough. Updating is not enough. We have to uh, start, uh, if possible, uh, a new venture, new yes. education. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kamal. And um, now we will um, hear the discussion from our very own DIUs, Professor Mohammad Masum Iqbal. And uh, I would actually request Professor Iqbal to talk about what DIU has been doing. Plus, maybe if you can shed some light on the prospects and challenges of uh, entrepreneurship during the pandemic and after the pandemic. So the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you, Madam Tahsina. Can you hear me, please? Am I audible? Yes, sir. We can hear you okay. loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to pay thanks uh, to Professor Foster for your wonderful deliberation. And really, I was delighted to listen to you. And you are so pragmatic, comprehensive, and enlightening. And it is really useful. And your deliberation, I have seen that you have accumulated all the critical concepts of a business. If I'm talking about in your model, I'm talking about market opportunity, leadership, and people financing, marketing, strategy, and all. So these are all critical factors or critical issues for the success of a business. And you have incorporated all these factors in your model. And then if I'm talking about the example, so Zoom, I believe it is a vivid example uh, for so, so digital entrepreneurship. And it is a global example. And if I see the critical features or important factors of the success of Zoom today, the first thing is what I see, market. They could understand the market, the needs, People have the needs and the entrepreneurs, I mean, the sponsors okay, could address the market, the first thing. And then as uh, they could address, they could have the right people, people. And you mentioned that it's a very slim company. Probably number of people are not that big, but they're the right people. They're committed. They're dedicated. If I'm talking about the human resource of the company, what it means? Human resource is a thing that runs the company. So what the company will be doing, it depends on the people who are working in this company. So these are the important aspects uh, for the success of Zoom, as I understand. And yes, definitely pandemic. Zoom found or has got a, an a exponential growth okay, during this crisis, during this pandemic, because we're on, on we're all on online and we are as I say, using the connectivity. I mean, what Zoom offers us, it facilitates us to get connected with other people, right? To communicate with other people. As you have said that online conference campaigning. So I pay thanks to Professor Foster to, uh, to, to, to take Zoom as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example in your deliberation. And it is a vivid example of digital entrepreneurship, what we're talking today. As Madam Tasina said that, uh, to focus on Bangladesh and definitely international university, I'd like to say a few words about that you'll be surprised to have some information. I would like to share some piece of information with you all. Say, Bangladesh, you know, it is a very small country. It is a very tiny country. But if I see the population size, it is not small. It's very big. We are having about, say, 170 billion people in our country. It is a small country, tiny country, but there's so many people living in this country. And by, among all these people, 50 million people are internet users. It is more or less 30 or more than 30 percent of the total population are using internet. If I'm talking about the social media users, Facebook and other social as uh, media platforms, the people are using. See, it is about 50 million people. Again, again, more than 30 percent. And one information may surprise you that it's, uh, mobile connections. If I'm talking about 170 million people that are in our country, but do you know number of mobile connections? is more than the number of people living in this country. It doesn't mean that each and every individual is using cell phone, but there are so many people you'll find who are using more than one, one cell phone or more, more than one uh, say, a connections, mobile connections. So what it means, it indicates that I feel it is my, I suppose Bangladesh is a fertile land for digital entrepreneurship. And if I'm talking about Daffodil International University, Madam Tassin has already mentioned that Daffodil International University is only the university in our country, which is having a department by innovation and entrepreneurship. Madam has also mentioned that our so, so the chairman of the board of trustees, okay, Dr. Mohsen Khan, is as uh, so he's uh, he's focusing on entrepreneurship. He tries to help the students of this university, in fact, the young students of this country, to make them entrepreneurs. And Madam has also mentioned that we don't want to create job seekers, rather we want to create job as, as, as providers of job creators. So by the way, what I want to, I'd like to mention, we know Tom, uh, Peter, sorry, Peter Drucker, Peter Drucker. And there is a statement by Peter Drucker. Business has two functions only. The first one is innovation. Number two, marketing. I repeat, Peter Drucker says a renowned management scientist and Peter Drucker, Peter Drucker stated that business has two functions. The first one is innovation and number two, marketing. 
I tell you, in Bangladesh, Jeffrey International University is only the university which has a lab for innovation where students can cultivate their idea, gray matter, they can bring something new and they can innovate things. And we have every facility in our innovation lab. And then definitely international universities, only the university in our country, which has a marketing lab. We're encouraging our students okay, to work in this lab, to practice, to cultivate, uh, to, to, to exercise different issues and uh, concepts of marketing. In that lab, we're also inviting the corporate leaders or the people who are working in corporations, different corporations in our country, they can also use our lab. So it is only the university in our country, which is entrepreneurship focused, business focused. Because this university has two unique labs, which is very rare, rare in our country. I tell you, the first one is innovation lab and number two marketing lab. And by the way, the, my last comment is that, so I believe all individuals, all human beings are entrepreneurs. And even with the teachers, we are also human beings. So we are also entrepreneurs. If we, if I'm talking about that, uh, so when we, we used to people in the caves. We came up the caves. We did whatever we needed. So. Is in my blood, our blood. But we, we are not aware of it. That is the problem. We are not focused. And in our university, we are trying to encourage our students to be entrepreneurs so that they can make their own placement and they can create placement for other people. And the last point is, by the way, digital entrepreneurship. The vivid example, Professor Foster has mentioned that. So Zoom, it shows. So digital platform or computerization, internet digitization has made uneven business feel even. Usually in physical uh, so context, we see the big, big companies, giant companies drive the small companies away from the market. But in digital platform, digital entrepreneurship, if I'm talking about everybody, is, each and everyone is equal. Anybody, everybody can start entrepreneurship, can business in digital platform. So there is an even so platform and any new entrepreneur can enjoy the same facilities, which can enjoy the big, big companies in a, in a given environment. So that is all about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal. Um, we know that it's uh, almost midnight in Professor Foster's um, uh, place, so we don't want to keep him waiting. But we do have a question for him from Dr. Mohammad Akhtar Zaman, the director of Blended Learning Center at DIU. So uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Mohammad Akhtar to uh, post the to pose the question uh, for Professor Foster, and we will hear from him, and then we will uh, wrap up the session. Uh, Dr. Mohammad Akhtar Zaman. Uh, Dr. Akhtar, if you could unmute yourself, we can't hear you. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, now it's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, at first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Josh Foster from Stanford Graduate School of Business. Professor Mustafa Zad Kamal, uh, the Honorable Treasurer for Bangladesh Open University, and our Honorable and very own uh, Professor Masum Iqbal Sardin, Faculty of Business and Entrepreneurship at Deputy International University. Actually, Professor Josh Foster is an Australian also. Uh, he's an Australian and uh, he was the he was received the order of Australia and I saw him while I was in Australia uh, with Michelle Stark and uh, with two former Prime Minister of Australia um, John Howard and uh, Tony Abbott so from there I uh, got uh, I got some introduction about him and today I'm very pleased to have him at, at Deputy International University through a webinar so uh, my, I am very much focused on about, and he rightly, uh, Professor Foster uh, is rightly mentioned about uh, the digital entrepreneurship, about um, this uh, Zoom platform, how small business it was in the beginning, but now the company is a giant company. And also we have to think about the security and other issues. He rightly mentioned about, uh, you know, the uh, Google Meet, was was uh, was not in uh, in 2019 or 2018 but is now becoming very popular because of the uh, zoom is better but the security issues is a big concern in the us uh, in the us and they stopped uh, zoom in different companies big companies they stopped using zoom but they came back to google meet and microsoft teams because of the better security 
So we have to think when we'll talk about digital entrepreneurship, we have to think about the security issues. It's a big issue that is rightly mentioned by Professor Foster. And uh, Professor Mustawazad Kamal, sir, he, he described some context in Bangladesh about digital entrepreneurship. And Masum Iqbal, sir, our Honorable Dean, is also uh, highlighted some of the portions about uh, the entrepreneurship innovation uh, and then uh, then sir in at the Hotel international university particularly the department of entrepreneurship and innovation uh, also two labs of the innovation lab that is the first time i saw in bangladesh um, in bangladesh actually the innovation lab this is very promising uh, for bangladesh i believe now i want to focus on the role of teachers role of teachers in creating and promoting entrepreneurship in bangladesh and around the world so now i would like to ask a question to professor foster uh, professor foster i would like to ask a request to uh, give it a, a bit details about what are the roles of teachers what are the role of teachers in creating and promoting entrepreneurship at stanford university Professor Foster, you have to unmute yourself. I can control the mute. Yes, now now you're audible. Yes. Go okay. On, All right. Yeah, I'm used to uh, controlling at my end. Um, just in terms of um, teachers, so uh, the professors have several roles. One is uh, obviously to teach uh, basic core classes such as accounting and finance and marketing, but but more importantly, in the second years and, and a lot of other classes, uh, we uh, do courses specifically on entrepreneurship and different parts. We've got over 40 different courses in our curriculum that the students can do on that. Some of the courses are actually building and, and packaging a company where they have to go out and, and sort of do experiments in the field to sign what a customer's wants in this area, what how are they being existingly met. Uh, we have courses in terms of entrepreneurial finance, which talks about getting to understand the various ways at which finance uh, for early stage companies is operated, whether they're through angels or other mechanisms. Uh, there are also courses on um, really international entrepreneurship. So how does that vary across different parts of the world? But I think the most exciting thing is that uh, when we teach cases, we actually have the entrepreneurs in the class. So uh, when I teach a case on Zoom, they, and, and I've, in the case I wrote, um, there are about five executives from Zoom quoted in that case. And so we did one hour interviews with oh, six or seven, and Eric Yuan gave us several hours of interview. Um, that enabled us to bring them into the classroom when we're teaching. And, and so the students can actually see the entrepreneurs being inspired. And we don't always tell success stories. Uh, if, it, if an entrepreneur has a failed venture and is wanting to talk about that, and we, we have examples of that in the classroom, the students get exposure to that. And most of the cases are written actually from students who came out of Stanford. Not always. But what that means is that the students can see actually the role models in front of them not just a case, but they can also ask a lot of questions about why did you do that? Or would you do that again? Or those type of questions. And so they actually see uh, inspiring stories or depressing stories. So they get to understand, is this entrepreneurship for them? Because I think one of the key messages is not every student has to be an entrepreneur. I mean, that, that's just not feasible. And, and so some of them want to go to larger companies. That's fine. But they've got to learn that that's, they, don't, they shouldn't go out to the field and sort of learn that cold. They should have experience by interacting with these people. So, And as we get them to do projects on existing companies, I choose which of those companies I'll write a case on. And one of the criteria is, will the entrepreneur be willing to come into the classroom? And if the entrepreneur says, no, I don't have the time, it doesn't make sense to me to allocate valuable teaching time to a person who can't inspire my students. I've got to inspire them somewhat, but they, they look at an educator sometimes as, well, you're a platform for our learning, but we don't really see you as a successful entrepreneur. 
And some of them are very cynical and say, well, if you're a successful entrepreneur, why are you here? And and so I, you know, I say, well, you know, I'm a successful teacher. And, and that's a vocation that's very important. But my role is to get the best out of their students. And for those who want to do entrepreneurship, I provide an effective platform. For those who want to go into sports management, I've got enough contacts globally in sports that I can sh guide them on that too. So I think, um, and the other thing is to teach them frameworks. So that framework that I said at the start, that's a rigorous approach that they have to go through and, and check out the, along the way on that and then learn from that if they're not making progress. Because if you don't meet your milestones in some way, shape, or form, you're going to have a lot of struggles in growing the company. It's not starting a company, it's scaling the company that's the challenge. Starting a company is very easy. Building scale and a sustainable scale is the much more hard part. Does that does that address the question, Akbar? I yes. think so. Yes. 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 Um, so before uh, we wrap up the session, I would actually like to connect Professor Foster's words with Professor Kamal's words, because Professor Kamal was suggesting that the students should be exposed to real life scenario. And Professor Foster actually highlighted that. And uh, we as teachpreneurs, uh, Professor Foster rightly pointed out that even though we, the teachers, are not entrepreneurs, but we can we can guide them and we should have the business connections so that we understand the potentials of our students as entrepreneurs and we can connect them to the right places. Uh, we would like to hear from Dr. Akhtar uh, one last time. Uh, so I would like Dr. Akhtar to uh, just sum up very quickly uh, for 30 seconds and then we will finish the session because it's been going for uh, one hour already. Yes, I will be finishing within 30 seconds. That is, I have another question actually. Uh, you know, during this pandemic, most of the universities in the world are offering online courses. The whole things are operated online, not face to face. Uh, in Bangladesh, WL International University is the leading from the front. We are totally online and we are our quality and standard are in online education are equally uh, equal equal to the practices in the Australian universities like Monash, I I, I believe. So now, actually, I have a very small question to Professor Foster as well, uh, for the second time that how they are conducting classes means all the classes, all the programs are online or do or do, do they do anything uh, face to face? Um, no, we, 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 we are doing classes both you know, in the last 12 months. Most of our classes have been online, but uh, and increasingly what will happen is some classes will be taught in person and there will be an online component. And what the digital world has enabled us is to have reach both to a broader set of students, but also we can bring in guests from everywhere. And so if I'm teaching a class on say, um, a global company, a global expansion of company going into say Singapore, uh, what I'll do is like one of the pe persons I know is um, Ying Lang Tang is a, one of the students I'm very familiar with. Well, Yingland has gone back to Singapore. He was at Carnegie and Harvard and Stanford, and he set up a VC company called Insignia. Well, very, very successful VC company. I can bring him into my classroom, and he, he's wonderful. And I mean, he's, he's set up, he's investing in a whole lot of ventures in Southeast Asia. And so if I've got students who are really inspired to think about global entrepreneurship, why not bring global entrepreneurs into the classroom? And that's what that's what the digital world enables us to do. So, I mean, if, if I'm teaching a class on, I mean, I'm teaching a class on the Indian Premier League, the Cricket League. Okay, well, I can ring up somebody at the BCCI and ask them to come into the classroom because I'm pretty familiar with that world. Uh, just imagine how inspiring that is to the students now. They may not tell me. I'm not sure the BCI would let me <laughs> give me the full story on anything on that sort of stuff. But uh, at least the students can see that. So I think it's really exciting that it's opened up a whole new world that the digital it's called the World Wide Web because it's on the world wide. So I think it's exciting. 
Yes, Professor Foster, and we can readily understand your love for cricket and how connected you are with that world. Um, okay, as I already mentioned that it's actually almost midnight um, where Professor Foster is, so we would like to wrap up today's session. And uh, we do hope that the students, the business students, and any student who uh, participated in this uh, business talk acquired knowledge and skills of digital entrepreneurship and identify the prospects and challenges of digital entrepreneurship in the new normal context. And we hope that uh, the faculty members who joined with us today might be intrigued by the idea of teachpreneurs to promote and patronize startups or ventures. And thank you very much for your participation. We would like to thank the technical team working behind to make this talk a successful one. And finally, our heartfelt gratitude goes to the panelists, Professor Kamal and Professor Iqbal, and the keynote speaker, Professor Foster, for contributing so meaningfully. All of you have a great day and good night to Professor Foster from Bangladesh. Stay safe. Bye-bye.